quick introduction. Uh, my name is Keith Hudgens. I work in technical alliances for Docker. Um, what that means is I'm our storage specialist, uh, w uh, working with partners who are storage, uh, who are storage either developers, providers, or whatever. Um, I maintain uh, the certification code uh, for testing for storage integration with Docker products. Um, I am my background. I'm a system administrator. Uh, I've done a lot of Linux-based automation, a little bit of Windows automation. Um, and I've done everything from uh, you know just run websites to uh, build uh, large cloud infrastructures for uh, for public facing customers. Um, these days, I spend my job, I uh, spend most of my time working with folks exactly like you, uh, making sure that stuff gets integrated in the Docker just right. Um, I'm reasonably technical, um, but the farther we go on into this talk, the farther I get out of my uh, direct domain of expertise. But I guarantee you, there's some speakers later in the conference that can answer some questions that I can't. So um, let's get going. Um, oh, one, I've been asked to let everybody know there's a couple of uh, uh, frequently asked questions just for the conference. Um, if you want access to the, uh, to the conference uh, like schedule app or need access to Wi-Fi, if you have the, the, the SDC pamphlet book, um, look on page two. There's a, um, uh, there's a, a a, a doohickey you can uh, you can take a photo of uh, and it'll uh, and it'll link you to uh, yeah it'll link you to the app um, and then also the Wi-Fi details are there as well so um, let's get going uh, so I actually already went I, I nor I'm almost always a slide ahead um, on when I talk so just go ahead and uh, um, so just go ahead and uh, um, deal with that because I'm a little slow. Um, on hitting the next button. Uh, a couple things to be, be aware of with this talk. This is a survey course. It's kind of a 101 of container storage and how and where where storage integrates with containers and the various access points. Um, so I'm, uh, the talk itself, I'm not gonna go super deep on, on anything in particular. If you have questions, feel free to ask, um, but, but hold them to the end. Um, because this is there's a lot of stuff in here and we need to go through it pretty quickly. Uh, this, I do work for Docker. We are one of the major um, we are one of the major uh, container vendors, uh, but we we are not the only one. And this is also not a vendor pitch. This is meant to be a, a, a full, neutral, complete survey course of where storage works uh, in the industry. So. Um, Really, really quick level setting. Uh, for those of you who aren't super familiar with containers in general, uh, what a container is, is it's essentially just a process uh, running, on, uh, running on a server. Um, the, uh, the process can be underneath a hypervisor or it can be running on bare metal on, on a kernel running actually on the hardware. We don't really care. Uh, when, the, when you start a container, we'll, uh, we'll kick off one particular process. Um, and that process theoretically can spawn multiple uh, processes like a, like, a typical, uh, like a typical OS in it, but you normally don't want to because that, that it gets harder and harder to control the, the complexity of your container when you do that. Um, each process runs in its own namespace, so they're walled off from a lot of, from a lot of resources of the system. And the control of that, the control of what resources that process can access is handled by, is handled by the actual container engine. Um, you can uh, you can declare uh, you know depending on the container engine and depending on uh, what you're dealing with you can control access to, to specific hardware uh, whether it's a, whether it's a st storage controller a GPU um, network whatever a lot of that can be controlled but typically network is kind of is, is shared access uh, most most hardware access is shared access but you can directly bind uh, hardware if you need to um, once the container is up and running you have a system image it's essentially kind of a, it's just like a VM image it's it's a full it's a full disk image of the operating system um, you can trim it down to exactly just what you need to run that one process and that's great if you can do that um, the, the uh, it's a copy on write image once that container is shot in the head uh, and we shut the process down, we do not save anything on that copy on write image. So the base image for the container is ephemeral. So if you want, if you're, if if somebody wants to run a container that requires persistent data, there's other ways. There's other ways to access storage for that, and we'll talk about that as we go on. So um, who who's who in the container world? Uh, these are the community organizations that deter determine standards for containers. Uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is the primary one. Uh, that's where um, most of the standards for for what a container is and does is maintained. Uh, CNCF has. Um, projects underneath it. 
the open container initiative is is um, is related to the CNCF. They're not exact. The OCI is not exactly a child of CNCF, but they work together very closely. Um, and so the the standards of what a container image looks like, um, how how you declare what processes run underneath it, and all that type of stuff is, is are all OCI standards managed by the CNCF. And we're going to talk about another standard later on, the container storage interface for persistent storage. All of that's an OCI project. All of this is underneath the umbrella of the Linux Foundation as well. Um, so for open source projects, it's all this kind of loose conglomeration of stuff. And the people who are interested just start contributing code and start talking on the forums and mailing lists. And eventually, people get appointed as directors of these things. Um, so for container storage types, uh, the different types of storage that you're going to be dealing with when you plug into containers, uh, there's three that we're going to be talking about. There's uh, runtime storage, which we call the graph driver. That's actually how you manage uh, the copy and write diffs and layers for your, uh, for your actual uh, container image. Cold storage for your container images, which is where uh, where typically your container image is going to be stored um, before the before the container actually launches, um, and the, we and from in Docker we call that registry storage. Um, it's not always called registry storage for every container image um, uh, for every container runtime system. They're a little bit different depending on the vendor, but it, this concept uh, can, exists across everybody. Uh, one one interesting thing for cold storage is that there are online community repositories of containers of container images. Uh, Docker Hub is probably the largest one, but uh, Red Hat maintains one, um, and quite a few other vendors uh, do as well. Um, and then finally, uh, the part that most people are concerned with when you're thinking about plugging into containers is, is persistent storage, and we'll spend more time on that than the other two as we go on. So this is a bit of a, 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 a graph of um, kind of uh, what a, a running uh, container uh, running container system is going to look like. Uh, the um, the gray the, the dark gray objects in the graph are the three different points of where can, of where your storage is going to plug in. Um, so you've got graph drive you've got a graph driver running on each individual container host. Uh, so the green boxes are basically just servers running containers. Um, you have a backing store that plugs into uh, the, that can plug into either your graph driver or uh, your registry storage or your volume or you know persistent volumes and stuff. And then those the registry and volume storage plug into different points of uh, of of the running system. So uh, we'll we'll refer back to this as we go on when we talk to each type. So graph drivers. Um, the integration point for the graph driver is can, is determined by which container runtime you're running. The mo by far the most common container runtime is container D. Um, container D is a is is the the kind of de facto standard. There's a couple of other standards out there as well, and we'll talk about those as we get go on a little bit further. Um, the even even those fundamentally kind of use the same code. Um, but this uh, this link to an article is, is uh, from the Moby project, which is upstream uh, to Docker's. Uh, it's an open source upstream project uh, for Docker's uh, uh, commercial offerings, and this is written by one of the Docker engineers. And it's a really really good overview of of um, the the decision making process for which graph driver we decided to, uh, to use. But fundamentally, there's kind of two driver styles. You got overlay and snapshot. Overlay is basically uh, is is literally just writing layers. Um, that taking multiple uh, multiple disk images and just uh, stacking them up on top of each other. Um, there's uh, there's some kernel uh, there's some Linux kernel uh, uh, code that helps do this. Um, Overlay FS is the most common one that's used. Um, AUFS is another one, and then once you, and then snapshot is relying on the snapshotting capabilities of of the underlying storage system. Uh, to be able to manage the layers of that. So you're going to have ButterFS, ZFS, Device Mapper. Uh, Device Mapper is typically running, uh, at least in the Linux world, running a bunch of uh, LVM kind of uh, LVM slices. But, um, but above that, um, it, we, just have this, we just have a driver that manages the layers for, for the operating system image. So what we do when you launch a container is, um, is we'll pull the container image from some kind of cold storage, whether it's like Docker Hub Online or a local storage image or something that you built locally. And then that image is copied, that container image is copied into the local system into a directory that, uh, that's kind of reserved for active running containers. <clears throat> 
and then um, once the container uh, once the container uh, process starts up, then we'll immediately write uh, we'll, we'll create an empty layer for any for any diffs that get written to that disk as the container starts up, uh, whether it's logging any kind of temp files or anything that needs to be written, um, and then we just maintain diff layers as the drivers decide that they need to that they need to uh, write diff layers, and when the container dies. Um, those uh, those diff layers are are uh, are either ignored or cleaned up later on, uh, typically, and um, and then and and then those diff layers are gone by the time the system uh, rolls off a, a few hours later, um, typically. And then you'll you'll we normally keep a copy of that base image in a local system just to speed up other container launches um, later on. But you, if you if you, if that original image is deleted, then we'll just do the, the entire process again by pulling it from cold storage. So we talked about container runtimes. Here's a list of the most common ones. Docker, um, uh, Docker is based on container D. Um, it's the default for the for most container installs. It has by far the widest uh, user base, um, probably something like 70-80% uh, of the market at least. Um, and then CoreOS uh, has, uh, has a container runtime called Rocket, RKT. It's, uh, the design of Rocket is meant to be extremely thin, extremely simple, and it doesn't do a lot on purpose by design. It's meant to be just the, th the absolute thinnest container, man uh, container engine uh, that, you, that you can throw in. Um, the CoreOS project was recently, uh, or CoreOS company, which has the Rocket project underneath, it was recently acquired by Red Hat. Um, so um, what's interesting is Cryo, which is the next container uh, engine, is also is also like the major uh, the major developers of Cryo is also Red Hat. So what's going to happen between uh, between Rocket and Cryo, we don't know yet. Um, as a community, we don't know yet. Anyway, um, Cryo is intended to be a Kubernetes native uh, runtime. So for those of you in the container space, Kubernetes is an orchestration engine that manages not just the container itself, but entire application stacks that are made of containers. Um, it has keep alive code, uh, scaling, uh, scaling systems to where if you need to, if you build a large application stack with a bunch of web servers and some load balancers and things like, things like that, it will actually uh, maintain scaling rules and make it easier for developers to run, uh, to run your uh, container system. Um, Cryo is intended to be a Kubernetes native uh, runtime for containers, so it's a little, it's uh, it, it's it focused explicitly on that. Um, the upstream of all of these projects, Cryo, Cryo, and Rocket are both uh, uh, CNCF efforts uh, at this point. The code for those have been contributed to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, as well as Containerd. So, all of the core open source part of the of container uh, of the container space is all managed and 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 owned by uh, the the uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation at this point. So we're about to talk about, we're gonna talk about cold storage now. Um, and cold storage is basically just local, uh, local to your network storage of, uh, storage of container images so that when you, when you start a container, uh, container launch, you don't have to reach out to the internet and download megabytes or sometimes, depending on the vendor of the container image, gigabytes of data uh, every time you wanna launch that container. So um, there's a bunch of private registry uh, pa soft, uh, software out there. Uh, Docker registry is one of them, um, but there's a bunch of other ones. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, they, but all of them back up to one of two things. They either file-based storage, which, uh, which by default just writes to the local disk of the host that's running that particular service. Um, in the case of Docker registry, Docker registry runs as a container. So we actually require when you run that container that you create a persistent volume uh, to, store, uh, to store images if you're going to do that. Um, and if you if you create a persistent volume and you want to keep that across multiple hosts, then you want to have some type of uh, uh, some type of network attached storage to deal with that. Or we can back up to object storage, which pr and all of the registry systems basically use one of these two things. Um, a, a really common registry pattern for software development teams is they'll actually produce containers as an artifact of their build process, and so they'll use something like Artifactory or some other um, some other um, like software object. Uh, you know, some some CI/CD uh, uh, object registry to be able to store that kind of stuff. Um, so that's really that's a really common use case as well. Um, Docker registry can use either of these. Um, supports any local mount of, any mounted local file system for file-based storage, whether it's network attached, local. We don't care as long as we can just uh, read the file from disk. We're good. Um, and then we also support S3 and OpenStack Swift as far as uh, object storage APIs, and that's actually a pretty common standard across uh, across everybody. 
uh, those are the two object storage APIs that everybody talks to. Come on. There we go. Um, so we're going back to the same chart. Um, now we're going to the, to the uh, to persistent storage, which is where um, most people are interested in actually uh, actually doing integration points. Um, this is the most important integration point for most storage vendors, period. Uh, the reason being is that um, for cold storage for registries, those APIs are pretty, are pretty core defined and open standard APIs that everybody either already talks to or has products that do. Um, for graph uh, for the graph driver storage that tends to be baked into your container solution and you're just going to use and, and the users are just going to use whatever they're whatever they're using for that um, there is some room to differentiate in graph driver uh, in, in graph driver processes I'm, pr I'm convinced that they're not the most efficient thing that we could uh, that we could have yet um, there's a few vendors out there that have uh, third-party graph drivers uh, portworks does I know um, but Persistent storage is one of the places, is basically the place where stored vendors can differentiate and uh, provide value to your customers. Um, there's, um, there's not a lot of support in the container ecosystem for native persistence. Um, when I say that, uh, within the container ecosystem, there's a, there's a we, like as Docker, I maintain our storage partners and maintain the relationships. We have about 20 different uh, vendors that are partners uh, with us for, for storage, and almost all of them are focused on persistent storage. But just last week, there was a thread on Reddit where, uh, on Reddit's Docker uh, um, subreddit, that was, people were telling a new user, do not run databases in Docker. The reason is, is community wisdom. Com the community thinks that you can't run databases in containers. Um, I've run databases in containers in production, and they work just fine. Uh, there's a couple of, there is some, there are some management issues. You don't, we don't really have a good orchestration system for managing scaling of traditional uh, databases. Um, master slave replication and dealing with promoting, uh, uh, promoting uh, slave workers up to, up to master if you need to. Uh, in the case of fail failover, none of that's provided within, within any, um, container orchestration system, so you kind of have to run them as singleton containers, but it's totally doable and it works fine. But the community doesn't know this. So what we need as, a, as, a, as, a, as the storage community is basically just some, le some uh, thought leadership to tell everybody, yeah, this is good, we're ready to do this. And um, there's a bunch of ways to do that. Um, so as far as how to integrate, every integration works basically the same way. Um, you're, you have a plug-in or integration code depending on how you're integrating into the major storage frameworks. Um, and your, uh, your plug-in will basically listen for commands from the, uh, from the storage uh, or from the uh, container orchestration engine or, or the container orchestrator or just a basic container engine depending on how you're integrating. And, um, and it'll just be an API call or just an API. Typically, it's an API listener. Um, the command comes to your plugin. Your plugin translates that API call to, to your backing storage systems API call. You stand up whatever type of whatever type of storage that you're mounting on the local system. Uh, if it's block storage, then you'll carve off uh, you'll carve off a block from your uh, from your backing store. Make sure that it's plugged into the OS on the container host. Uh, make sure it's formatted, mounted, and available to the uh, to the container system. And then you report back to the container uh, system what mount point you've man you've run that container. At launch time, we bind, we just bind mount uh, the uh, the the volume into the containers uh, into the containers file system at runtime for the container, and that's basically how every container uh, storage persistent storage system works. Um, the APIs are a little bit different. Um, some have capabilities that others don't. If you've got snapshot, RBAC control, things like that, quotas that are built into your storage system. Most of the APIs, some can do a little bit of that, some won't do a lot of it, um, and some have some pass-through uh, that users can determine things. Um, but that also depends on how you're running containers. Um, if you're running raw Docker containers uh, with Docker Swarm versus Kubernetes or Mesos, they have different ways of how you want to manage containers. Yeah? Acronym I haven't heard there before, Role-based access control. Role-based, okay. Mm -hmm. Role as in like an AWS? Uh, yeah, or um, basically, yeah, it's just basically just a, uh, it's, it's a privilege group that's, uh, you maintain uh, privileges in a privilege group, and that's called a role, and then you assign users into that role. Um, and for, for system administration, it's kind of, it's, it's a common acronym, um, but if you're, if, so it, it's, um, that's typically how we manage, uh, how we manage store, or how we manage uh, access rights. So the three major container frameworks in the market right now, 
Docker Swarm, Kubernetes, Mesosphere. Um, I, I put Docker Swarm first because I work for Docker, not because it's the most common. Kubernetes is by far the most common these days. Um, it's, uh, it's an open standard that was developed by Google, um, had passed to the community, and um, now almost every vendor in the container space has some sort of Kubernetes solution, including Docker. We ship uh, Kubernetes with Docker Enterprise. And uh, Mesosphere, which is uh, the container orchestration framework, framework maintained by the Apache Foundation. Yes? How are Docker Swarm and Mesosphere comparing in the market in terms uh, of adoption? I know that Kubernetes is the big slot on the development. Yeah, the way, I see, uh, the, way, uh, the way I've seen things recently is that Swarm and Mesosphere are basically legacy at this point. Um, we, we, don't see, we don't see that many new Swarm or Mesosphere uh, project adoptions. Um, the, uh, the most, the, the only, at the moment, the only runtime uh, underneath Mesosphere that has a storage integration is Docker Engine. Um, uh, Mesosphere is starting to adopt commun uh, some community APIs for storage, but, the, but that isn't there yet. And so we tend to see a lot of that type of stuff for, um, uh, for commercial folks that want, that want support. And generally, almost everybody uh, doing a greenfield project wants to do uh, wants to do Kube these days. Um, so, for Docker Swarm and Mesosphere integration, like I said, um, we use the Docker Volume plugin. Um, it's uh, if you want to use the Docker Volume plugin, you have to run Docker Engine. You can't run Cryo or, or Rocket because it's the Docker Volume plugin. Um, support. Uh, we have two major versions of the of the uh, plugin API, V1 and V2. The, both of them are supported right now. Um, V1 is our older is our older version, and the only difference between V1 and V2 is that V1 is required to be containerized. Um, V2 has also has in your container there's a manifest file that you'll specify what system access permissions using the Linux capabilities um, kernel feature. You'll list what Linux capabilities that you need um, in the uh, in the um, in the Markdown file for their for your uh, not Markdown uh, YAML file for your specification. You'll containerize it, and we'd require in V2 that you bind to a Unix local socket. Uh, you can't bind to TCP. Um, V1, you can. Um, so um, V1 supports Windows and Linux. Uh, the reason V2 does not support uh, does not support Windows is because there's uh, when we initially rolled out V2, Windows didn't support a lot of features that we needed uh, for V2. And at this point, the focus is all on Kubernetes. Um, so we're not really planning on updating that a lot because Microsoft's working really hard on uh, on some uh, on making sure that Kubernetes storage uh, works on Windows. Very uh, so that's just kind of where that's going to be. Um, the documentation is uh, linked here. Um, again, it requires Docker Engine, um, and the API is really really simple. Um, you basically there's four there's four verbs: uh, create, um, uh, create, mount, uh, delete, and uh, and and just uh, like list. Are the only four verbs in the uh, in the API. Um, so, oh, the other thing to be aware of with uh, with uh, Docker with, with Docker volume plugins is that if you've uh, we actually uh, as Docker we maintain a, a helper library. It's written in Go that already implements the uh, the Docker facing side of the API. So even if you're not a Go developer, the code's pretty clean, so you can follow along and see how it does it. Um, so Kubernetes integration. Um, like we talked about just a little bit earlier, Kubernetes is the de facto standard for, for new container projects. This is where your focus should be, to be completely honest. Um, the, um, it's a community project. Uh, so because it's a community project, there's a whole bunch of developers for a whole bunch of companies that are working on a whole bunch of, uh, whole, whole bunch of uh, um, different needs. So because of that, um, there's a bunch of different ways to integrate storage into Kubernetes. Um, so let's go through this. Let's go through those real quick. Um, first of all, before we go through the, uh, the the storage integration points, Kubernetes is very operator centric. This is something to know when you're when you're working on planning your your integration. Kubernetes is operator centric. It's not developer centric. Um, so what I mean by that is that people who are operating a Kubernetes installation, the admins and the admin and, and operators of the Kube installation have a lot of tasks and duties to keep this thing running, including preparing volume offerings uh, uh, to users. The Kubernetes volume concept, storage concept requires uh, you, the administrator will prepare a storage class. And then underneath that storage class, you, uh, you declare storage uh, offerings. And then users can say, hey, I'm, I need an application I want to use certain amount of storage off of this particular offering, and then Kubernetes will start reaching out to that. So, um, and so the persistent volume claim is basically the, that's the official request that, um, a runtime request for storage. Uh, 
uh, that a user will say when I'm launching an application stack, I've got a persistent, uh, I've, I want a persistent, I'm making a persistent volume claim, and then Kubernetes will return a persistent volume uh, that can then be mounted into uh, mounted into your container. So um, one of the things when you're when you're dealing with this is that Kubernetes can absolutely uh, run that should basically can run that container on any node in that Kubernetes cluster. So you need to be able to make that volume available to every node in that cluster. Um, so, um, and then Kube will, Kube will take that volume and then mount it on whichever node. It'll send a command through the Kubernetes control structure to an individual node and say, hey, mount this volume. So uh, I've got some links here to get started on taking a look at the Kubernetes con storage concepts. Um, the, uh, in particular, uh, the, uh, the contributing uh, link at the bottom has a lot of details on how to get on, on resources. Uh, the first one is just kind of the overview of the storage uh, subject of uh, the storage SIG so that uh, with meeting times and that type of stuff which is useful as well. Um, be aware um, I can't go super deep on questions on on the cube uh, on developing stuff for kube yet. Um, I'm still working on uh, I'm still working on uh, our, our actual tests to certify kube storage. So um, I'm still coming up to speed with this myself. <coughs> so the first of the storage types for kube or entry storage drivers. So this was the first option available for persistent storage in Kubernetes is the, co the driver for, for storage for access to whatever your persistent volume is is baked into the Kubernetes source code. Um, this is a problem for a lot of vendors because if you're working, especially if you're working for a really big company, some of the companies don't always want to have to go through all the legal hoops to figure out how it is to contribute your IP to some community open source project. So this is a non-starter for some developers just in the first place. Um, most Kubernetes distros will ship these drivers natively. They just they come in the kube code, so they're just they're, they just ship with them. They don't always support them, but they're there and available. Um, we got a link here. An example volume driver um, is uh, is RVD, um, which is uh, just that is literally their example driver. Um, it doesn't really do a lot, but it gives you. It, but the code is really simple and clean and easy to follow. Um, and again, you'll have to join the Kubernetes community organization. You have to sign their contributor license agreement for uh, for assignment of IP when you contribute code to the Kubernetes source tree. So that may or may not be a fit for you as a, for or for you or the company you work for. But that's the first way to integrate your storage with Kube. Uh, the second is Flex Volume. Uh, Flex Volume is an API, so you can own your code and distribute it separately from from Kube. Uh, it's the first released persistence API for Kubernetes. Um, it's fully generally available and supported as of Kubernetes 1.8, which was released about a year ago now, maybe. Um, the docs on it are kind of hard to find. Uh, the, 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 the Kubernetes documentation team is busy doing a refactor of their documentation, uh, so things are moving. So the link that I have underneath that, um, that's actually, um, that's in their, contri their, their contributor's guide. Um, it took me about a half hour to find it. Um, hopefully it's still there when you uh, when you want to go look at it because uh, they're, they're in the process of reorganizing it all. Uh, this is an internal Kubernetes project. It is an official Kubernetes project. I don't see this API going away anytime soon. Um, however, what I recommend that you take a look at if you're going to be doing Kube integration is the container storage interface. Um, this is not yet generally generally available, but it should be GA end of the year. And the reason it's not GA yet is because the actual storage spec, the, the API spec is still being worked on. They're doing some very minor tweaks and changes at this point. Um, but um, I have a lot of partners that, are, that have CSI drivers right now, uh, and some of them have customers using them in production. Um, I wouldn't recommend that for people yet because the API might change, but uh, we do have people actually using it. The reason I recommend people focus on CSI is that the container storage interface is actually a community standard. The CSI API spec is a project of, uh, of the, uh, Open, Compu uh, the um, Open Container Foundation, uh, which is underneath CNCF. Um, as well, uh, the, other, the other interesting thing about uh, CSI is that there are other orchestrators, um, Cloud Foundry, which isn't even really a container. I mean, it has container capability, but it's actually a platform as a service uh, product from Pivotal. And Mesos uh, have, have both uh, announced that they're going to be rolling in CSI support to their products as well. Um, there's a strong possibility that Docker will do the same thing um, if I have my way with the uh, with the rest of the storage strategy team. <laughs> We're working on that, um, but hopefully we can. Uh, hopefully Docker will actually adopt that for native Docker uh, storage as well for people using Docker Swarm in the future. Um, 
that's not a, a that's not an announcement because we haven't actually decided on it, but it's my intention. Um, so the container storage interface uh, has its own GitHub uh, has its own GitHub project. Uh, there's a bunch of repos in there that, that are useful. Um, just go go to the easiest thing to do is go to the top level uh, project and just uh, browse through the repos. There are several examples um, of how, uh, of uh, drivers uh, that are pretty easy to follow. Um, and the full specification is in the uh, is in the actual, the repository called spec. Um, it's pretty simple. It's it's similar to the Docker volume API, to where except that um, it's it's RPC instead of instead of HTTP. Um, but it's it's but it's very similar otherwise. There's just a handful of verbs. Um, it supports more verbs than the Docker volume API does. I know they're working on snapshots, uh, like official snapshot support, so that people using uh, can can people using things can. Um, users basically who are running an apl application stack can can say hey you know I want a snapshot every hour or however often so that's going to be there so that's basically the talk ended about 10 minutes early thanks guys <laughs>